Heavenly Father, we ask that you would um, take this discussion today, Father, and, and make it powerful and also for your glory, that we would stay on track and on and in your word, that we would not add anything or take anything away. Difficult passages and controversial topics aren't easy, but they certainly are not to be avoided. So we thank you that you have placed this in our lives and in this time. Um, I hope it's not a reflection of why so few are here, <laughs> um, but we do pray for those who aren't here. I know um, Deb is traveling. Cindy was not able to be with us and just found out that Jan's husband is hospitalized and is not in good shape. So uh, we pray and lift those things up to you, Father, for um, our ability to be in the ministry of intercession and that we are hurting because they're hurting and that we can um, just lift them up to you right now and be able to know that they're completely in your hands. So we ask that you guide this discussion and we ask for all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. That's okay, so as I said in my prayer, hey Bev, there's a um, smaller number today. Oh my goodness, I see. <laughs> we have a nice uh, small group discussion. Um, I was telling, I was just praying and telling Catherine that um, there's Jan's husband. It was scheduled for surgery yesterday because he fell last week and, and now he has pneumonia. So he's been down, down into ICU. So uh, we need to let, I, I've already prayed for him, but just keep him in prayer and others who aren't with us for various reasons. Um, Today, we're going to be discussing what we studied this week, and I wanted to just kind of give a little bit of, of caveat that this is a difficult subject. Um, it's actually not all that difficult, but it could be controversial. And certainly, mm -hmm. the next three chapters that we dipped our toe in this week, and we will go in depth next week, uh, 12, 13, and 14, are highly controversial chapters. Yes. So in a way, it doesn't surprise me that only two of you showed up. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> that have nothing to do with it, but um, it might have something to do with it too. And hopefully whoever isn't here today is able to watch my video because we are recording it as usual. Um, but we're going to dive right in. Um, we are in chapter 11, and obviously we want to put ourselves, this is highly important to put us into context. <laughs> context rules all interpretation. Um, but chapter 11, <clears throat> a segment of the book where Paul has had things written to him, and he is responding to those things. So like I said a few weeks ago, this is kind of like the game Jeopardy, you know, where the, Alex Trebek would say the answer is, and we, you have to come up with a question. Well, we don't really have to come up with a question, but we know a question has been asked or a complaint has been lodged or a discussion, you know, just something has been said and Paul is addressing it. We started in chapter seven with this segment and we dealt with divorce, marriage, and remarriage in chapter seven. We dealt with staying in the condition in which you were called. In other words, it's not, you don't have to change mm -hmm. your life because of salvation. Your life changes because of salvation, but your position and your status and your role now on earth doesn't necessarily. And then he moved in chapters eight and nine and 10 into food sacrifice to idols. Um, and in the middle of that, he talked about a complaint <clears throat> lodged or judgment against him. But overall, he said over and over and over, and this is part of what we want to take into chapter 11, is over and over, it was, he was saying that we can, we should even limit our own rights for the sake of someone else. We do have rights. We do have liberties, as they might be called. Um, we are not under the law. We're under grace. But really, I always look at the law uh, is what we're standing on, and grace dwells above it um, in the sense of Jesus always okay. up the ante. So we don't do away with the law, but the law does not provide salvation, and it never did. Never did. The law pointed people towards Christ and pointed people towards their need for salvation. And it does give us a basis of what God would want or not want. But mm -hmm. it's not a, we don't go to the temple and sacrifice animals. <laughs> yeah. 
do that. You know, Christ our sacrifice. Thank goodness. Yes, thank <laughs> the good Lord. Um, Jesus' sacrifice was once for all time and did everything it needed. And we just celebrated that, you know, just this past weekend. It's his sac his sacrifice, but also his resurrection and that we praise God for. So in chapter 11, that he the question was asked, we've already answered, he's changing subjects somewhat, but also remember he has stayed the course. All is going to be consistent. But we see something in chapter 11 that he talks about in, I think it's 14, but it's 12, 13, 14, somewhere in there, where Paul seems to contradict himself. And I once had a, a really great fundamental, you know, teaching great fundamental truths pastor say, anytime you find a contradiction, and I'm putting that in air quotes, contradiction in scripture, it's time to stop and look at that because God does not contradict himself. Right. Paul writing this is not writing to two different groups of people. It's in the same letter <laughs> that he writes two things that seem to contradict. So they can't That's So we won't necessarily be able to look at the one in 12, 13 and 14 that as deeply, but we will next week. Or I would suggest if you're not directed to look at that subject more closely that you on your own, take the time to look at it more closely. So anyway, I'm just putting this into a, how do we deal with what's going on in chapter 11, keeping in mind that Paul is always going to tell us to think of the other person over ourselves. Okay, so number one. Number two, in these chapters, I loved that we went on to 12, 13, and 14 because we found a very critical statement beyond chapter 11. And that is God is not a God of confusion, but a God of order. So we want a subcategory within the section of the book of these, and then we've done this already. We've had the two big major segment divisions, the first one being things that Paul was told, and now we're in the things that he was written about that he's addressing. And then within those, we've already talked about what was in chapter seven, what was in eight, nine, and 10, what's coming up in 12, 13, and 14 is spiritual gifts. And then we'll go on. Did I get that right? 12, yes, 12, 13, and 14. But from 11 through 14, there is another little category, and it's what I just described. And that is God is not a God of confusion, but a God of order. So this is about orderliness. And I rarely go forward and tell you that in advance, but it's going to be so critical when we look at this chapter, especially the first part of this chapter, that we keep that in mind, that God is a God of order. So really everything we're talking about in 11, 12, and 13, and 14, and really throughout the whole book, but this segment especially, constantly tell yourself, constantly remind yourself that this is about orderliness, okay? And I think it'll help tremendously. It helped me tremendously when I grabbed hold of that. Okay, so when we look at chapter 11, the first thing he says is, be an imitator of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now, this is, there are no chapter divisions in the original. This is kind of a concluding statement and a preview statement. You know, it kind of, it's one of those that bridges, goes backwards and forwards, and really is its own statement because it's its own paragraph. And that is, do what Paul does as he's doing what Christ taught him to do. You know, it's not just Paul's this great guy, but follow me as I'm leading you towards Christ. Then he talks about in, in verse two, he says, now I praise you because you remember me and everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. So this chapter is about what? It's just traditions. A, traditions, right. So this chapter, if you wanna put that subcategory among what he's dealing with is about traditions. We looked up some cross-referencing this week. Traditions are always good, right? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> traditions they can are, be. The, the traditions of men. Yes, traditions. absolutely. And that can be, but even the traditions of men aren't always bad, but mm -hmm. 
tend towards that, if, especially <laughs> if we start focusing on those. And that's what was addressed in a lot of the cross-referencing is that, for instance, they would dedicate a portion of their monies or possessions, and they put it under the Corban, as it was called. Uh, my, my son's name is Corbin, but, you know, so it's kind of interesting. But under the Corban, meaning that they were um, set apart and not to be given to something else. That's not the worst thing, but they were doing that feeling really good about themselves and not taking care of their parents. And Jesus is like, uh, uh. I, I mean, I've actually had people ask me, they were on very limited income. And, um, this one woman was, um, she was on a limited income. She was a widow and her daughter was helping her sometimes financially, but her daughter didn't have a lot of extra money. And so she was like battling because she was like, if I, if I give money to my mom, I can't tithe to the church. And she was beating herself up about that. Oh. And yeah, and I was being asked about it. And I'm like, I literally referenced that verse and said, taking care of your parents would be bigger than the needs of, of your local church. But I still believe probably that she could be tithing to her church and giving to her mom because usually we're not managing our money that well. But if not, if I'm wrong about that, if you have the choice, you take care of your mom hmm. and God's going to be good with that. I mean, that's, that's uh, obviously would say, say my opinion, look at scripture yourself, but that verse I think is, is clear. Jesus is saying, you know, you're neglecting your parents and God would never want that. Um, and that's, it, it, it might be a child, not a parent. It might be a sibling. It might be a friend. It, you know, it's not always in that one direction. So we have to look at the, the laws. We have to look at the traditions of God and we have to look at the traditions of men and evaluate them in light of the principles that God lays out of what is more important. And, and one of the best examples of that, I may have already given this one is the Ten Commandments say that we are not to bear false witness. Sometimes we say lying with that. False witness is usually talking about testimony in court, but still we are not, we know we're not to be deceivers. We're not to be liars. And yet you see the midwives in the story of the Exodus mm -hmm. commended by God because they valued life over lying to the Pharaoh mm -hmm. and they made the right choice. Okay. Um, if you've ever looked at the story of Corey Ten Boon, there was the issue throughout of her sister, Corey's sister that was married and independent, refused to lie, even if it meant exposing the people that she was trying to protect. And the Ten Boon home, Corey's parents' home, her father and sister's home, um, they, they believed that protecting the people in the house was a higher principle. And it was just two different opinions and God protected everybody in both situations, which is, is part of incredible part of their story. But um, I mean, they literally in the, in the sister's household told the truth and it was so blatantly non-believable <laughs> that, that the authorities overlooked the, the people that were hiding. They're like, they literally said they're under the table and there literally was a trap door under the table. <laughs> And they wouldn't look because it was like, if, if they're telling the truth, they can't be hiding anything. <laughs> so it was incredible how God protected them. But, um, but the people that were in under the trap door weren't real happy with them in the moment, but <laughs> yeah, seriously, and I wouldn't have either. So in this situation, traditions aren't always good. They're not always bad. What we need to do is be discern discerning and look at each. And we certainly should never add on our ways and exalt them to the point of ignoring God's ways. That, that's, the, that's the trap we can fall into and be careful about. So this, this section, this, this chapter is about traditions. What are the two big subjects, according to traditions, that Paul deals with in this chapter? Women's hair covering. Okay, head coverings, and what's the second one? The observance of... Are, are you talking about the communion? The yes, 
the Lord's oh, Supper. Oh, yeah, the communion. Okay, those are the two big subjects um, that are going to be talked about. So we've got head coverings. And the Lord's Supper. Okay, so in your work this week, um, we're going to kind of tie in if you did any commentary work. Um, we're going to try to tie that in because my the commentary work I did was extremely interesting. I literally had two very different opinions about this first section. <laughs> but I wanted us for a second in a little different way than normal, because usually we just stick right to the text. And I, I definitely want to do that. But I want us to think about this first section on head coverings. Let's think about ways that we know in our lifetime, whether we agree with it or not. We're not talking about let's make a judgment about it, but just tell me ways that this section of scripture talking about head coverings, men without them and women with them, how has that been told to you, preached to you, practiced in front of you, or you're aware of, or isn't anymore? Like, t tell me all the ways that you've heard about this. I grew up a Roman Catholic. My whole family, all the women used to wear mantillas to, to mass. Okay. I had a mantilla, the little chapel, chapel veil that you would wear, and they call them mantillas. Okay. Um, we used to wear those, um, and uh, at some point, there was an announcement, I remember, at church that became very controversial, that the women didn't have to wear them anymore, okay. and that was a big deal, and, and some of my family members stopped going to their churches and went to more traditional churches over that. Okay. Um, so that was a big deal. And the only other thing I can think of, of dealing with head coverings personally is the, the Arab culture with their hijab and um, women, and they still carry that on to today. Yes. And in some cases, less so and more so. I mean, it, again, there's a, there's a diversity even within that, depending on how strict that nation is, that area is, that set even that household is, but yes, I agree with all that. Do you remember, we're all old enough <laughs> to remember women wearing hats to church yes. as just normal. It was, it was a normal everyday Sunday thing. I mean, or if you have watched any movie or any program that is set, let's say in the 50s, 60s, set, even into the 70s, um, women wore hats. Now I, I'm not Roman Catholic, so I didn't know about the, what'd you call it, mantilla? Um, I didn't know about that, but it doesn't surprise me. Um, have you, in more recent years, ever been in a church service where you saw someone, a woman, wearing something to cover her head? Very seldomly, mm -hmm. but oh, uh, usually on like like an Easter service okay. or, 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 or a Christmas service, that kind of thing. Okay, to dress up maybe? Right, more, more, more probably for dress dressing up than okay. for any tradition. Okay. I actually knew a woman in a church and I'm realizing it's more like 20 years ago that we went to a church and I think she still does. She wore probably something very similar to what you're describing. It had like a small round with like lace around it. And mm -hmm. she yes. It. Okay. Wasn't a Catholic church, but she wore that and she stood out in the sense that it was noticeable that she wore that. Okay. So have you ever been anywhere where when inside, outside, at a church, not at a church, somebody prays and all the men take their hats off? Oh, yes. I've seen yeah. that. That's still, yeah. that's still a tradition. That's still a tradition. And it comes from here, even though they don't know that's why they're doing it. Yeah. They're not tying those two things together. Men even entering a building and taking their hat off. Okay. Well, let's think for just a second about, well, for a long time, let's think about, again, context. Paul is speaking to the city of Corinth, to the church in the city of Corinth. This is made up of Jews and Gentiles, right? That's the mystery. Remember that right. Jew and Gentile in one body. That's the mystery that was hidden, wasn't even conceivable prior to Christ coming, dying, and establishing the church. Um, leaving behind. Okay. And then those being the apostles, Paul included, um, spreading 
his ways and spreading his teachings. And the traditions Paul is talking about here are the oral handed down traditions that were given to Paul mm -hmm. that Paul is passing on. Okay. Paul comes from a background of Judaism, but he mm -hmm. is the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul has firmly established in previous chapters that we just already mentioned this, that he's all things to all people that he might save some. Okay, so he has an ability to not cross the boundaries into sin in order to save somebody or to, to spread the gospel, but to relate to them where they are, which is exactly what God wants us to do, where God found each one of us is exactly where we were. And we didn't have to clean up our act to get there. He right. took us where we were, but he also took us like he's over here and we're over, way over here. And he brought us to him for reconciliation. He didn't come to us. He didn't lower his standards to us, but he took us from where we are, were at the time of our salvation to himself. And that's called reconciliation. And then we have the ministry of reconciliation to others. Okay, so in this context, I'm, I'm, strict, I'm, I'm really trying to stick to context. And remember that God is a God of order. We have to think about what was going on in this culture. Okay, number one, women wore head coverings yeah. regularly. It was a sign of... Um, covering their glory in a sense it was a an ability it was the women that didn't wear head coverings maybe that's the opposite we need to look at were had a tendency to be like prostitutes and if you were cutting your hair or not covering your hair it was a sign of rebellion a, a, a sign of going against the culture going against authority okay so keeping that in mind when they were coming to their services or their church time or their meeting together, as he calls it later, covering your hair was a part of daily practice, but certainly a part of their worship practice. Okay. It was even said that during this time that some were getting so out of control that they were not only throwing off their head coverings or not wearing them to start with, but they were letting their hair down and flowing. That would be what in the service? What would that cause? Didn't, maybe I, I didn't read this in any commentaries or anything, but okay. wasn't putting your hair down one of the intimate things that they did in their bedroom? Yes, especially when they had long, 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 long hair. It was number one practical because they were around fires and cooking and stuff like that to wear their hair up. But yes, they had certain clothing that was worn at certain ages, like the length of skirts could be different. The, uh, the type of clothing, like a boy would wear a dress until he was getting into his pants, you know, kind of thing that was uh, from past. There was also the braiding of the hair or wearing the hair up depending on your marital status. There were, there were differences, but yes, lay, letting your, ma your husband see your hair down was an intimacy. It was absolutely an intimacy. So can you imagine a woman coming into a church service and letting it all hang out as far as her hair is concerned? That would be a major disruption. Well, that's even a term we use. Uh, if you let your hair down, you're like, you're, you're doing all go, right? you wouldn't normally do. That you just wouldn't. Yeah. That, that's a term that you use. Oh, absolutely. they let their hair down. <laughs> yep. And you're absolutely right. And even, I mean, you've got a short haircut. I used to have much shorter hair. Um, you know, you're, you've already let your hair down. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mine's down all the time. <laughs> right. But that's what we have to realize is in that time, it would have represented something completely different than it represents today for me to walk into church with my hair like this you know, not with any sort of head covering, okay? And so as we look at these verses, I want us to think of several things, like what can this mean? What does it not mean, all right? So number one, does the head covering talk mean, really mean their hair? 
it, it actually says in this passage that the woman's hair is her covering, referencing back even to Eve. Okay, so, and that in nature, we see, generally speaking, women with longer hair and men with shorter hair. But that wasn't always the case. Some men wore their hair long, barbarians a lot of times, you know, the ones that were way outside, they would wear their hair long, maybe even pull it back in a ponytail or a queue as it was called. Um, so it wasn't universally known, but just by normal practice in, with humans, you usually saw women with longer hair and men with shorter hair. But if this is talking about hair, how long it is and whether or not you have it, and it's saying that a woman needs to have her head covered by hair, and a man doesn't need to have his head covered by hair, then every man in a church service needs to be bald. Right? Oh, I guess, yeah, I've never thought of it that way. Right, so it can't be hair or hair length. It can't be talking about that he's using hair as an example, he's using hair to illustrate a point, but he's not talking about hair length. He's and he's not order. He's talking about the order, the he's order. Orderliness is what he's talking about, right? But when he also talks in um, verse three, and we, and we need to put this up here. He says, I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. He's the right? covenant. He's the covering. He, okay. And well, it says, and here it says he's the head. Let's just, for, for just now, for this verse, let's just stick with head. That Christ is the head of every man, and, the ma and man is the head of woman. And then it says, and God is the head of Christ. Okay. So I guess I could have just not put this here. Let's just put this. Okay, and this is talking about head. Okay, if you looked up the word head here, most often I've always heard it's talking about authority. That it's saying that God is the authority over Christ and Christ is the authority over man and man's the authority over woman. Okay, that's the most of the way I've always heard it. But when I looked up this word, this word isn't talking about authority at all. In the Greek of this time, this word would not have ever been used about authority. And it wouldn't have been talking about the literal head, like the, the part of the body. If it was talking about authority, it would have been talking about the gut. That's where they thought, they didn't know anything about the brain and the central nervous system, like we know where we understand that it's here that controls it all. That's when, so when we hear head, we're thinking brain, we're thinking control center, we're thinking authority. But in this case, that's not what it's talking about. Head is more like the head of the river. The source. Beginning, the beginning then? The, the beginning or source is a better way of looking at this. So the head is more of the source, okay? Because, Christ is God, right? So how can God be an authority over Christ? Because there is, with Christ and God, there is equality. And with man and woman, there is equality. Yet there is order right? Jesus submitted himself or turned to the father and looked for initiation from the father. Okay. Jesus said, I don't know the day or the hour that I'm going to come. Only the father knows the day or the hour. And yet Jesus is God. There is equality there, but there is an order to it. Okay. And Christ, he doesn't say son. He says Christ. And I, I don't want to separate them too much, but sometimes the use of the different names for Jesus is significant because if we're talking about God's the son, we're talking about not about something different than Jesus, but Jesus in his role here on earth as man, even though he was never not God, 
he played a part and a role and a time and there was a little difference there. And Christ is the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one. Jesus was his earthly name. So when you look at how those things are used, it's important to know. Okay, so there is equality in the Godhead and there's equality between man and woman, which Paul talks about here, is one is not independent of the other. And here's why this is so important. Prior to Christianity, this was not true for women. And, and we've long, we've fought a lot of battles in our lifetimes or seen them fall for to get the acknowledgement of equality for women that should have come in Christendom through what Jesus did. Jesus told the first person he ever told that he was Messiah was a woman. So the woman at the well, she wasn't even a worthy woman. The woman at the well, he declared himself Messiah. He didn't even declare himself Messiah to his apostles. So I think that's significant. The first woman, the first person that saw Jesus incarnate, uh, re-resurrected was Mary Mag of Magdalene. The first person who got to evangelize and spread the word about the risen savior was a woman. The woman that sat at his feet that he commended for sitting at his feet was Mary, not that same Mary, but a different Mary. Well, sometimes we think, anyway, um, she was uh, Martha's sister and Lazarus' sister and, and Jesus commended her for sitting at his feet, which was not done. Women weren't taught in the Jewish culture. They didn't get to sit under teaching. They didn't get to go to school with a rabbi. So Jesus acknowledging her and saying what she was doing was important was huge. Okay, so here, Paul isn't demeaning women. He's not putting us in our proper place. Paul acknowledges and understands the equality between we stand before Christ, we stand before God, equal. But we got to remember here in our role on earth, because of the fall and other things, there is an order to things. And just like my children, as, it, as saved people when they were younger than grown adults were under my authority and under my husband's authority in our household and needed to be obedient in God's eyes as far as them being Christians and me being a Christian they were equal but in their role here on earth there was a difference and that's what we've got to understand is orderliness and order however you want to look at that is what he's talking about here. Okay, so in a church service, as they're coming together, what was normal for that time was that a woman covered her hair. That's part of this. But the other, when it says, and it goes into shaving her head and it would be a shame, he's saying that if she won't do what is best for the whole group to stay in order and not be disruptive, that's a shame. It shame so much that her head should be shaved. Not really shaved, but that a woman's head shaved was a shame. It was a shaming thing. Um, and they would shave a woman's head to shame her at times. Um, if you think about it, even at the Holocaust, one of the things they did to the women when they came in is they shaved their heads. They shaved the men's heads too, but they shaved their heads and it was, it was a shameful thing. Um, but here's the thing it also says is kind of the why. In the order of creation, and you go to Genesis 1, 26, it says they, the Godhead, created humans, says man, but it means man in the word of human, humankind. And then it says that he created them, male and female. Okay. Paul doesn't really reference that part. He just says that man does not, oh, no, I'm sorry. He says, uh, for man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. For indeed, what man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Um, 
he also, wait a minute. Okay, it's verse seven. Man ought not to have his head covered since he is the image and glory of God. If you go back to the Genesis account, it doesn't say glory. It just says image of God. And then it says, but the woman is the glory of man. Okay, we know in Genesis 126 what it says, but then we go to Genesis two and God fills in the details. And the way he created man, or actually the word is formed man, it's not created because he create he brought man out of what he had already created, which is the dust of the ground. So God had already created the dust of the ground, ex nihilo, out of nothing. And from that, he formed man. Then he goes through the process of showing the man that it's, well, he declares it's not good for man to be alone. But he also shows man through allowing him to see all the animals having two and he didn't have a corresponding part. So Adam got the object lesson and then God took a rib from his side. That's the originating out of man. He took a rib out of his side, closed up the, the side and formed woman from the rib of Adam's side. Okay, I'm frozen. I hope y'all can hear me. Um, and then he, okay. Um, and then he brought the woman to man, which there's so much symbolism and all that even in our wed wedding services. But that's what he's talking about here. It's, it's the source from which something came, the start of it, the origination of it is part of what it's talking about here. Okay. So he's saying that if a man covers his head while he's praying, has any sort of symbol of covering on his head, that it, it, it covers this glory, which is Christ, his head. And if a woman since the man is, is the originator in the sense of the woman coming out of man, she is his glory, but she's also the corresponder to him. She's equal to him. They were going to be co-dominion -domin over the earth. Um, the fall messed that up, but it's, so, so it's, it's kind of all like tied in together. So part, then the next thing it says is, therefore, the woman ought to have, and mine has symbol of in italics, meaning that these are words that are added in order to help us have a clearer meaning, but they aren't in the original. But it says, therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. That's a little weird. That's harder to understand the whole because of the angels thing. We need to remember that angels are a part of our unseen world. They're around us all the time, and they're certainly part of the church services, should be. They, they're going to be there. They're also ministering to us all the time. We just don't see them, but they're watching. And they're I, all, um, Go ahead. I assumed that that maybe had something to do with that, the issue the with the angels mingling with women and the giants being, you know, back in Genesis um, I assume maybe it referred to that slightly, maybe. It, it, it's possible. Honestly, it's a little nebulous as to what this is talking about for sure. But certainly um, the angels that I think that he, it's referring to here would not be fallen angels. I think this would be more of the angels that did not go off with Satan, did not fall and did not become demons are ones that are ministering spirits to us and they're around and are watching, but they're also always looking into this redemption that they don't get and don't fully understand. I mean, they understand it from the sense of kind of like we understand the Trinity, like we get it, but we really don't get it. <laughs> I mean, they're in his presence. They're going to understand the Trinity better than you and I are. Um, and, and we're going to understand it fully someday. But it's, it's just hard to wrap our minds around in, in the sense that salvation was not given to the angels. Salvation was given to humans. So they look into it. They watch this. They're seeing it. But it's not for them. But we're also created beneath them for a little while, Hebrews tells us. But later, we're going to be above them. Okay, but this is interesting. The two different commentaries I read talked about this symbol of authority in the sense of one said, this shows that the woman is under the authority of man. Okay, and most of the time they talked about husband and wife. Is there any indication in this passage that he's talking about marriage? 
Mm-mm. Nope. He's talking about the church service. He's talking about their coming together. Well, and he mentions that part later, but he's talking to a church. He's not talking necessarily about a husband-wife relationship, although I think it definitely can be applied there. Don't get me wrong. But he's not mentioned marriage here. And here he's saying the woman ought to have, let's take out symbol of for a second. The woman ought to have authority on her head because of the angels. What has he talked about in this passage that a woman with her head covered is going to be doing when she's with other believers? What are the two things? Two Ps. Oh, prophesying and praying. Prophesying and praying. Okay. Is that normal in this culture prior to this time? I thought the women were separate from the men when they went to church and they were supposed to be completely quiet at church and not utter a thing. There you go. So this is different, isn't it? Paul's actually talking about something that is different than the way it was before, where a woman is now praying and prophesying. And this is the controversy of the other chapters where it says a woman is to remain silent in church. Hang on to that because you're going to learn, hopefully this next week, what he really means by that. But he can't mean that they're to be silent in church and they're to pray and prophesy because those are excluding each other. Those are mutually exclusive. Here he's talking about praying and prophesying. And in you read this week, if you looked in those, you know, got your toes dipped into the 12 to 14, he talks about the spiritual gifts, talks about prophecy being a big one and a very necessary one, right? And that it would be for the edification of the body, right? The church. Therefore, if a woman is able to and told here, like since she's going to pray and prophesy, not if or whatever, since it's going to happen, he's just saying, how should it look and what should you be doing? And he's saying, in this case, in this time, your head should be covered. Okay. Now, if he really is saying symbol of authority here, one person's one commentary said, and I've heard it most of the time, is saying she needs to have the authority of her husband over her in order, that's the man over the woman, in order to be able to do that. If she doesn't have that, in other words, some have taken it so far as to say, if her husband isn't with her, she needs to not say anything. Oh. I've heard that said. Just these are some of the things that I've heard. Well, well, in that case, a single woman or a widow couldn't do, or, or you know, I mean. There you go. And is Paul talking about that? No, he doesn't say for married women. And he doesn't say, I mean, so this would mean, you're absolutely right. This would mean if you're a widow or if you're single and maybe single for life, not just single for a time, because at that point you'd have your, if you're single, you would have your dad's authority over you. That would be the man. Okay. But a widow wouldn't have that right so what is she just supposed to be silent from that point forward and cut off this usage of this purpose in her life so this is a lot of like what does it mean what does it not mean and so we got to keep that and but one other commentator said this was very interesting i never heard this before this isn't saying she's under authority it's saying she has authority for the first time in the history of these people and ever within Christianity, women have authority that they didn't have before. Like you were saying, they usually were separated, not taught mostly at all, sat over there, had to be quiet if they were even in the building. They were not, they didn't participate, they didn't anything. So this is a change. So it could mean, and, and I'm just going to leave it there. It could mean that she is, the head covering is a symbol, but she's under the authority of men or man, um, which that has usually been taken way too far. And like every woman is under the authority of every man. And that's abusive. That That is spiritually abusive most of the time, let alone what it could be otherwise. Um, this is not necessarily in the context of marriage, although I think it, I definitely think it should be applied in the context of marriage. But for the first time, because he also talks about this equality 
He talks about the interdependence. They're not independent of each other. That a man did not originate from woman, but now he does come from woman. <laughs> you know, that when you're talking about Adam and Eve, no. But from that point forward, every man from that point forward came literally out of women. So we should exalt them in that sense. And we should acknowledge their, their, that their, that reason. But the, the reason for the woman to be created at all was for the sake of man. But that also meant the man needed her. It wasn't for her to be his slave forever. It's they were to correspond. They were to kind of complete each other. They'd be those counterparts, as we call it sometimes, or the helper suitable. But, um, okay, so then it says the woman originates from the man. So also the man has his birth through the woman and all things originate from God. Let's, let's put it in his proper place. Where does all this come from? And then it talks about the nature itself. So the main thing he says next is if anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have um, no other practice nor the churches of God. So there were people that were always going to be in the state of argument and always going to be contentious. And Paul's just like, I'm done with you. You know, if you want to be contentious, but he's, he's praised them at the beginning for remembering the traditions that he handed down to them and practicing them. And then he goes into this about the headship, um, not the headship, sorry, the head coverings. And so I just wanted to put it like all out there and then figure out, again, overarching all of this is order. In our church services, this day and age, do we need to cover our hair in order to comply with Paul talking about this in 1 Corinthians 11? Because does that even have any significance anymore? No. No. So I'm not going to start putting something on my head when I go into church. And here's another thing to think about. Again, he's talking to Jews and Gentiles, right? What did Jewish men do when they pray? They covered their yarmulke. Head. There you go. They have the yarmulke on, right? And I think the Jewish women do something. But yeah, they have that. And they pull their, their shawl or their. Okay. Prayer shawl or whatever. Yeah. And pull it up over their head. Okay. Well, and he's saying, don't do that. So he would be like, maybe the Jewish men would be fighting against this because now they're going to have to take their head covering off and the women are supposed to be putting one on. But really it's, I'm not saying that we throw out traditions or throw out the Bible and what he's saying, but sometimes we have to look at what is the point, what is the principle. And when he was saying this, this would have been very disruptive if a woman's hair was just let go, let, let your hair down. If uh, they were getting frit, even um, overdone, I mean, like they were going crazy sometimes in these services and he's saying, calm down. Um, I had a pastor years ago talk about the women's role of the church. And one of the things he was actually saying was that whole idea of the silence. And we'll get to that next week again, that um, women needed to be told how to behave in these services so he wasn't saying, women, you need to be silent while men speak. He was saying that when the men were in the service, they were also quiet and silent. So the women were having to be told, when you come, this is how you behave. You're going to behave like them, not separately, differently than oh, them. Okay. okay. So keep that in mind when you look at it next week, because, again, this is not never should this verse about the woman having a symbol of authority on her head it should never be a subjugation like a putting of women down a putting of women under never in the new testament when it ever says that i am to submit to my husband does it ever tell my husband to make me okay i am too willingly i'm to do it willingly and I'm to respect him. He is never told, ever told to make me submit. So he is never to subjugate me. I am to submit. So take that in consideration when you look at this. We as women have a place and have a role. We need to do it in order 
it needs to be part of not being disruptive. Okay, so I'm a, and I've gone way longer than I wanted on this. Oh, well, no, I knew it was gonna take a long time. But I'm gonna give you an example. Do you, I don't know if your church has choir anymore, but we all grew up with church choirs, right? You know what a church choir is, right? And you know what church robes are, right? Church choir robes, choir robes are, you know what those are, right? Maybe they're not wearing them now, but you remember them, right? So this is maybe one of those things that's gone the way of the past. But let's think of why they were there in the first place. Okay. Sometimes we lose the reason. And that's what happens a lot of times is we lose the reason for something. And we need to be reminded of why it was in the first place. And it might be something we do away with. But still, the reason for the choir robes. Modesty. Right. Skirt lengths kept going up. And usually they were elevated and we could look right down through the bottom of their skirt to straight through the legs, right? Modesty, that was one of the reasons. That was not the main reason. It was uniformity, okay? So if I came in, okay, let's look at the different colors. You've got gray on, you've got, I think, black on, and I've got this bright. If we were standing, if I were in between the two of you and we were standing in the choir, who do you think they're gonna see? <laughs> right? Green. I'm, I'm going to stand out, right? Is the point of me being in the choir to be noticed? Not unless you're a soloist. Well, there's that. You might be standing <laughs> separately. You might have a microphone. Yes, you might be. You're right about that. But for the choir, the choir is to be harmonious and working together. And one is not to be distinguished from the other. Choir robes help do that. That's the uniformity of what choir ropes did. Um, in our church, they do still have a choir and they have a praise band and they have, a, I'm sorry, a praise team and they have a, a orchestra and everything in some of our services and others they don't. But they will coordinate, like this time of year, they're probably wearing spring colors. So the women might be wearing different things, but they have a range and they actually do that. And some people will roll their eyes and think it's ridiculous, but otherwise you notice that person. And the whole point is about order and not drawing attention to yourself. So if we think of it that way, we then we put ourselves back in the context of our churches today, how can we as women be in the worship service and not be disruptive? Because if we came in, I mean, have you ever been in a church service where somebody wouldn't take their child out? The yeah. child that you thought needed to be taken out and you felt really bad because you were judging them. <laughs> <'Cause you're> like, <laughs> but what did it do? You couldn't listen to a thing that man said while that baby is screaming back there. And the baby just needed to be taken out. It's my not. It hasn't happened very often, but my pastor has actually spoken up and asked the member not singling them out and pointing them out, but asking them, please escort your child out. Yeah, our bulletin, when we had bulletins, we haven't had them in a year, had a little thing on there going, we have a great, and they said it in a positive way, you know, we have a great children's uh, service and, uh, or uh, nursery care for your child. And, you know, basically um, don't be disruptive. I mean, however it was said, it was said in a really nice way, but I'm thinking, because seriously, nobody needs to be sitting there with a baby screaming. And you know that mom's not getting anything out of it. Yeah. Um, and then there was another statement in there. It's like, if you leave, not necessarily for a child, but let's say you are one of those people that gets up and goes to the bathroom in the middle of the service, stand in the back. You know, don't make it that everybody watches you come back to your seat and you clomp, 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 and you're stepping over everybody. You know, just... Sit, sit at the back if you know you have bladder issues and then come in and you're not a disruption to people. It's that idea is what he's talking about here more than anything else. But boy, this can be <laughs> taken and used and has been used. Okay, so let's go on to the next subject, which is the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper, what he's describing here is, is it the Lord's Supper? I mean, Paul even says. No, it's not a church party. Yeah, they were, if you've ever read Jude, you see the, these times of coming together, they called them love feasts. This is like the exact opposite of an agape fest. You know, this is, this is, well, let's talk about what is going on here. Number one, he talks about factions, right? And divisions. 
favoritism. Okay. Yeah, and the favoritism is coming as a result of all this. Um, but the, we've seen divisions before in this book, and those were based on the following of men. That's not what he's talking about here. He's talking about a different type of division. Here, it's coming from this either favoritism or a class distinction seems to be happening. Um, and when they're coming together, he talks about coming together and meeting together. This could be corporately, or this could be more of a small group setting. You know, this could be a smaller subset, you know, meeting together in even homes as, as it might've happened, but still it's the church. When they're meeting together, they were eating together and the Lord's Supper might have been part of that. They may have had an observance of, of communion every Sunday. But what was actually going on was no Lord's Supper, and it certainly wasn't a love fest, an agape meal. It was some were coming, and, and let's say the rich, who had more time on their hands, were coming and maybe providing most of the food for this communal meal, but they were going ahead and eating. So when others came, maybe workers, maybe even slaves were coming after they fulfilled their duties in, at the day. And I'm just like throwing in a few details here. Um, there wasn't any food left. And they may have been the ones that needed the food. Like they didn't have a surplus. Maybe they couldn't even bring anything because either they couldn't afford it or couldn't go home and get it and hadn't prepared it yet. And so at the end, Paul says, wait on each other. You know, when you come together and you have a meal together, honor each other. Remember going back, thinking others more highly than yourself. Honor everyone by waiting to eat together. Not leaving somebody without any food and hungry. And then you've gone so far ahead, you're drunk. It, neither end of that is love. So he's, when he's talking about love, he's talking about agape, which is that unconditional, the type of love that God shows, the type of love that needs not anything in return, that wants the best for the other person. That's the love that Paul's talking about. And he's saying, when y'all are coming together, y'all are worse off at the end. It's not better at all. Um, and he says um, in verse 17, I do not praise you. Now, he praised him in the beginning of this chapter, but here he's saying, I do not praise you because you come together, not for the better, but for the worse. Your, their assembling together was causing more problems than anything, and he's not commending them. And then he says, he talks about them coming together as a church. He hears about the divisions. And then he says, uh, there must be factions among you. Now, here's the thing. If we took a vote, <laughs> do we know that there are divisions and factions in our churches? Well, I mean, if nothing else, there's de Democrats and Republicans in our churches. Okay. There's if that. nothing else. You know, so yeah. else, females. There's married and unmarried. There's young and old. There's, yeah, there's all kinds of normal human distinctions. Yeah. But the other is there's humans involved. So just like Paul, we're expecting this. You know, we do expect this, but he wants to eradicate it. But he's a realist. He knows they're going to be that. But he also says these factions are in order um, that those who are approved become evident. So these factions, these divisions, these things that are going on are showing the unapproved versus the approved. So it, their, their behavior is the fruit is showing what, who they are and who they aren't. So, cause we know in all of our churches, there are people there that are unsaved. We've talked about that several times in this, in this uh, book as well. Then he says, if, if these meals are about feeding your need, your physical hunger, eat at home. That is not what this is supposed to be about. This is supposed to be about getting together and meeting each other's needs, not meeting your, self, your physical self needs. Um, and then he goes into what the Lord's Supper is. So he's told about what it isn't. Now he talks about what it is. And he says that he, he says 
for what I received from the Lord, I have delivered to you. And then he talks about on the night in which the, the Lord was betrayed, which is interesting if you think about it. Because if you're talking about the night that Jesus broke the bread, the original Lord's Supper, normally you wouldn't say on the night he was betrayed. Was he betrayed that night? Mm -hmm. Right. But when you're looking at this portion, we tend to say on the night they met together to observe Passover, on the night that they came together after their meal, the last time that Jesus got to talk to them as a group before, you might have said all those things. But Paul is talking about these unapproved people being evident, and now he mentions the word betrayed. It's kind of interesting. I think he was doing it on purpose to bring this up. And then he said, he, he took, goes through the steps that Jesus did. He broke the bread. He, uh, he gave thanks. He broke the bread. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And the same way he took the cup after the supper. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So both times he's talking about do this in remembrance of me. And when you go back and you look at what the account and what it says, he says, I will not drink this cup again until we're all together in the kingdom. So this is the last supper. This is the last, you know, that's the whole picture, the last supper. This is the Lord's supper. This is the love fest that Jesus is having with them. And they have had a meal. Um, and then he goes through this part. This is sometimes has been taken as the transubstantiation, but that Jesus did not change in front of them into bread. And the bread did not change into his body. He had yet to be crucified. He did this prior to the crucifixion for a reason. He could have done this as easily after the crucifixion and resurrection. He did it before. And there's a reason because it isn't, doesn't change into his bud. It is a representation. And each time we are not eating Christ in that sense, we are receiving him and we are to proclaim this until he returns. It is, we're, we're proclaiming his death until he comes again. Um, and the resurrections in the meantime, and that's awesome too. But as, as a as a Catholic growing up as a child, I um, and when I first transitioned to becoming uh, uh, saved, and I always felt that that I had had a lot more reverence and honor in the Catholic Church because of the way they look at communion. Um, because yes, they do believe it's transcendence substantiation. I can't say that. But, um, yeah. <laughs> but yes, they believe that that is what's occurring. And, and I can remember every single Sunday, I was emotionally affected by that. I would cry before I took my communion. And that's just my reaction I had. Well, and that's, that was probably part of your drawing, you know, part of your path. That, that God had you on. I did not grow up Catholic, but I grew up Methodist and we had a uh, different practice than I've seen a lot of times in, in most of the churches I've been to. So don't go to a Methodist church now, but there was a, a solemnness, a reverence, a quietness and, and a ceremony to it more so than I've seen in other places. Okay. So as we look at that, partly Paul is talking about that seriousness, that reverence mm -hmm. that thought because he goes on and he talks about let each man examine himself and if you look at these verses i've got examine judgment judge 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 judged and judgment one two three four five six seven different times in six verses so he's serious about this and mm -hmm. what he's saying is as you saw it this week what he's saying is examine yourself so there needs to be a, a great contemplation, even if like some churches do it on a particular Sunday, like let's say first Sunday, some do it every week, you know, whatever your observance is, however long, it might be two or three times a year, depending on your church. But a lot of times, you know, in advance, so take the time to examine mm -hmm. yourself. But even if you get to the service and you realize there it's the communion service or Lord's Supper service, take the time. I, I mean, I can hold that 
wafer or whatever in my hand while they're finishing up and I'm praying and I'm praying and I'm praying. As a Christian, I've only ever not participated once is I did not feel like I should in that because I was holding some, let's say some grudges. Let's just make it simple. I had turmoil in my life and I, I was holding some grudges and I just, I prayed even then and just said, Lori, I, I do not feel right now that I'm worthy, that I, it, of taking this, not a sense of unworthiness, but just that time. I actually had a time where I was teaching a Sunday school class and I knew it was Lord's Supper that day uh, before, it was before the church service. And there was this girl in the class, it was seventh grade girls, and I, she had never been in there before, but her, I knew her dad, I knew a little bit about their family, just really close. And I just talked about this whole idea, talked about this passage, because our, our pastor of that church always used this passage and always brought this to our awareness. And I, and before, it was interesting because before the church service, I found out later, she talked to her dad. They were in contention. I did not know that. She settled it with her dad. She got up from the pew and went to the prayer room and then came back and took the Lord's Supper. I mean, that just later just thrilled me and her dad even came to me and said it was because of what you said in Sunday school and it just she just came under conviction and she took care of it so I thought it was awesome but he says here very clearly that we are to examine ourselves and it's if you do have a church that practices this often, this is great because you have this opportunity. We should be doing this all the time, but we have this great opportunity prior. And if we don't examine ourselves and we don't make the corrections and changes we need, he says that if we take this in an unworthy manner, then we are eating and drinking judgment on ourselves. That's a serious, serious thing that he's talking about there. And he even goes on and says, some of you are weak, some of you are sick, and some of you have slept. Sleep is the euphemism for d death of a Christian. Okay, so he's talking about Christians. This is a consequence. If you are not judging yourself and you're taking this in an unworthy manner. Others would be the non-Christians, maybe that think they're Christians or so-called Christians or completely outside the church, that they would... Um, you know, this needs to be a witness to them. If they know what's going on in your life and you're just very casually taking the Lord's Supper, that's not a very good witness to them. Mm -hmm. And and we got to be careful of that. But we don't want to be condemned along with them. So that's the caution is we the world is going to be condemned and die and not go to heaven. We may be judged and have some consequences here on earth before our death, but we don't want either one of those. We want to examine ourselves and we need to be take don't take it in an unworthy manner okay we've gone over our time but i wanted to make sure that we looked at this again about orderliness the lord's supper was not being done in an orderly manner their their eating together was disruptive when we get into next week into 12 13 and 14 everything about those chapters is about order <laughs> just keep that in mind it's about god is not a god of confusion he's a god of order so how do we conduct ourselves and think about this brand new group of people coming in to these worship services that that are coming from very diverse backgrounds they're not to bring that in they're to come this is all new and, and Christ has a different way, and he's inaugurated a different way of doing things. Some of it's going to be passed down in traditions from the apostles through maybe to Paul, maybe through Jesus to Paul, and Paul is passing those on, and he's commending them for some and not commending them for others and answering their questions. But just think, this church is chaotic, and God is not about that. And our churches and our lives are not to be about bringing chaos into that. Now we're going to have chaos and we're going to have suffering and we're going to have afflictions, but that is not us bringing that into our worship services. So keep that in mind. And it's always to be thinking self-examining and to be thinking others more highly than ourselves and keeping things in order. <laughs>
the way they should be. So. <sighs> <laughs> This was one I struggled with. I really struggled because um, how this can be taken. But the next three chapters are, are also going to be a little sticky because there are vast different beliefs about the spiritual gifts. We're not going to even be able to come close to touching that. But we're going to see what Paul does say. And we're going to see how can we understand what we can, keeping it in order, and not adding or taking away. That's our goal. All right. Well, I'm going to stop. I'll pray. And those, if y'all are going to stay for, are y'all going to stay for the video? Okay. okay. Uh, y'all, y'all tend to. Okay. Um, anyway, we'll do the video. I'll take a break and then we'll come back, but we'll finish for now. Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, being a part of our discussion today for those who are able to be here and those who weren't. Um, for whatever is going on in their lives. We just ask that you would um, be with them and give them the encouragement needed to stay in your word, to understand these chapters, and to be able to come back when they're able, Be especially with Jan and her husband, as he has taken a turn for the worse. And we just ask that you would um, help the doctors know what to do for him and, and to get him back back into an ability to have the surgery that he needs also. So we uh, lift them up today. We thank you and just take you, ask you to take us through this next week as we study these next three chapters that are wonderful and powerful, but also controversial and difficult. So we just ask that you help us through those and bring us back next week for discussion. We thank you for everything and ask for it all in Jesus name. Amen.